It's good to be with you guys. It was about nine and a half years ago, I was finishing my PhD and I was offered a job to come work as a historian on the Joseph Smith papers. And I said, twist my arm a little bit more. Why don't you? It meant moving to Utah. And I, you know, had an aversion to landlocked states, but here I am a decade later, quite loving it. Um, my talk today is focused on the Joseph Smith papers and Christian discipleship. But to be more specific, the Joseph Smith papers and my Christian discipleship. See, for Latter-day Saints, something happens usually when they find out that I've spent nearly a decade immersed in Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith surviving papers. They ask me a question that goes something like this. How has working on Joseph Smith's papers affected your testimony? The implication being that perhaps by taking a deep dive into church history, my faith is a little bit weaker, or in hopes that by taking a deep dive into church history, my faith is now stronger. The answer to that question is simple to give, a little bit harder to explain. My testimony of Jesus Christ and the restoration of his gospel through Joseph Smith is unequivocally stronger because of my work on the Joseph Smith papers. But it's also a little bit more complicated. And it's that last bit that sometimes trips people up. What does he mean by more complicated? Do we have to be afraid of complexity when it comes to studying the history of the church? Now, a couple caveats before I dive into this. One, I am not saying that we need to overthink or overcomplicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That gospel is simple. It is meant to be simple. And I am not saying that a simple testimony, a simple faith is bad. That type of faith is good and should be treasured. What I'm saying is that we don't have to be afraid of complexity in the history of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so my hope here today is to share just a couple, maybe two, maybe three lessons that I've learned um, as it relates to my own Christian discipleship by working on the Joseph Smith Papers project. And, and I hope the big takeaway is that if we take these deep dives into church history, we can see that the restoration and the events that comprised it were wrought by a perfect God working with imperfect people, and that the messiness of it all, the imperfection of it all, is not a slight or a blight on the restoration, but actually makes it all the more miraculous. The first lesson that I have learned is about prophetic authority and humility. To say that we have testimonies of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ implies that we have testimonies of prophets. I believe in prophets past and present. I believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. However, spending years and years immersed in Joseph's surviving papers has complicated in good ways my understanding of what prophetic authority is and the humility that it takes to sustain a prophet. There's a truth that we all know as Latter-day Saints. It's that prophets are not perfect. But recognizing that truth is one thing, and comprehending its practical application is another. How do we recognize that prophets are fallible men called to divine work and still, still sustain them? How do we maintain our faith when a prophet says something that is hard or that we do not automatically agree with? How do we sustain such leaders? To this end, I turn to one of my favorite documents in the entire corpus of the Joseph Smith Papers. This is a discourse that Joseph Smith gave on October 29th, 1842. On this occasion, Joseph Smith went to the landing in Nauvoo and greeted a boatload of new converts arriving from Long Island, New York. He welcomed them and then gave them a word of counsel, a word that illuminates how Joseph Smith himself understood his prophetic authority. He declared, quote, I am but a man, and you must not expect me to be perfect. If you expect perfection from me, then I shall expect it from you. But if you will bear with my infirmities, 
and the infirmities of the brethren, we will likewise bear with your infirmities. Let's see. You see, something happened frequently when men and women arrived in Nauvoo. They came with very lofty expectations. They assumed that a prophet residing in the city would mean that that community would be spared of the growing pains found in every other American town and city at that time. It wasn't. Many also assumed that Joseph would lead perfectly. Joseph didn't. What I like about this discourse is that Joseph Smith reaffirmed his role as a prophet, but he recalibrated the saints' expectations of what a prophet is. For me, this means that I do not expect perfection from those called to lead the church. I do not expect to agree with every decision that they make. Perfection is not a prerequisite for my sustaining vote. I do not need to agree with every policy to sustain church leaders. What I need to do is what Joseph Smith said. That is, bear with the brethren in their infirmities so that they can bear with me in mine. How working on the Joseph Smith papers has changed and improved my Christian discipleship in one way is this. It's helped me recognize that following a prophet requires humility. That following a prophet is a communal effort of imperfect people working together to hear the voice of God and to implement his mind and his will. This is far more complex understanding of prophetic authority than I had prior to working on the Joseph Smith papers, but it has resulted in a stronger testimony, one that is better equipped to endure the lamentable but perhaps inevitable tumult and debate that occurs in and around the church. Let me just say a quick word about the lesson I've learned about revelation as a process. We see this in the documents Joseph left behind. Sometimes it is difficult to find the words that convey what God wants us to know and to do. Have you ever felt the Spirit, and you knew you were feeling the Spirit, but it was not immediately clear what God intended you to do or what he intended you to know? And you had to work, and you had to pray. It was like that for Joseph Smith. We see this all throughout the Joseph Smith papers. In his different accounts of the first vision, we see it in small ways. How do I describe the pillar that descended upon me in the grove? Was it fire? Or was it light? And we see Joseph in 1832 alternating within the same document between fire and light. And then in 1835, he goes with fire. And then in 1838, he's a little more confident that it was light. But what we see happening here is Joseph Smith wrestling with and grappling with the imperfections of mortal language. How do you describe the things of God? within the confines and constraints of imperfect language. It happens like that for us too. Joseph Smith had revelations that were miraculous moments, like flipping on a light switch, instantly apparent what God wanted him to know and do. We have those sometimes too. But for Joseph Smith and for us, far more often, I believe revelation is a prolonged process more than a miraculous moment. So what does that have to do with my Christian discipleship? What might that have to do with your Christian discipleship? Maybe, just maybe, we receive more revelation than we realize. We're just not looking for the right thing. Maybe, just maybe, God is trying to speak to us more than we thought he was. And we just need to be a little bit easier on ourselves and understand the process of revelation, that revelation is work. Okay, last point. And the last point is this, that continued faithfulness can illuminate and compound past spiritual experiences. This is to say that we will have spiritual experiences that we recognize in the moment matter, but we may not fully understand their significance until we have more time and experience with the Spirit and with the gospel. Let me give you an example from Joseph Smith's life. And again, it's the first vision. 
Joseph Smith's first attempt to write down his first vision was in 1832, and it's in a personal history. And he's essentially saying, let me tell you how I came to know that God is real and that Jesus Christ is his son and our savior. And he writes his account of the first vision very much as a personal Christian conversion. In 1835, we get the next account. And this time he's meeting with a minister of another faith. And he says, essentially, let me tell you how the Book of Mormon came forth. And Joseph Smith does not start with September 1823 and the angel Moroni. Joseph Smith starts the narrative of the Book of Mormon coming forth in early spring 1820. By 1835, Joseph Smith understood that while the first vision was his personal Christian conversion moment, it was also an important step in the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. It could be both. And then in 1838, we get the account that we know best of the first vision. It's in the Pearl of Great Price. And this comes as Joseph Smith is working with scribes and historians to create the history of the church. It would be a formal publication. And he's essentially saying, let me tell you how the church came to be restored. And he does not start the story on April 6th, 1830. He does not start the story in September 1823 with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. He starts it with the first vision. By 1838, Joseph Smith understood that the first vision was a personal Christian conversion experience for him. It was a key moment in the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, but it was also a key moment in the restoration of Jesus' church upon the earth. So what does this mean for my Christian discipleship? What might this mean for your Christian discipleship? I've never had a vision of the caliber or type that Joseph Smith has had, but I've had spiritual experiences since my youth. And as a young person, I understood that God was speaking to me, that God was intervening in my life. And I understood those as significant moments, even as a teenager, even as a young adult. But it was only with time and experience and continued faithfulness that I began to fully understand what God was trying to do in my life. I know this kind of sounds like an old person saying, you guys don't understand what God's doing to you now. But it's true. And when you get older, you can say that type of thing to the young people in your life. That sometimes it's only as we get older and have more experience as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ that we can fully comprehend what God is trying to work in our lives. So those are three of the, the larger lessons I've learned from the Joseph Smith papers as it relates to my Christian discipleship. I could probably go on and on for hours and hours talking about these. But let me just say in concluding that the Joseph Smith papers then are a valuable resource, not just for scholars, but for Latter-day Saints seeking a deeper understanding of the prophet Joseph Smith and of his Christian ministry. I believe that I'm a better Christian because of the Joseph Smith papers. But as grateful as I am for the project, I want to be clear about something. A deep knowledge of church history is not required for salvation. As far as I can tell, no church history test is administered at the gates of heaven. There are no scantrons, no blue books, no number two pencils. This is important because it prevents us from stopping short of the mark. Sometimes with the Joseph Smith Papers podcast, I'd say, this isn't your grandpa's church history. Now, I love your grandpas, okay? But so many people think church history is fun facts or guys raising their hand in Sunday school to tell you really weird details or to talk about how great their ancestor is. And that's all fine and good, but we might lose one of the main purposes of church history. If we are studying church history as part of our discipleship, let it be at least for one reason, a way of remembering the marvelous works that God has accomplished in the past, using imperfect but willing people. Let it be a reminder that he can do the same with us in the present if we exercise faith and humility as individuals and as a people. To sum it all up, if you're using the Joseph Smith papers and hoping for more devoted Christian discipleship, I would say this. Be smart, but be humble. Thank you.